All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Just give folks a few more seconds to jump into the webinar. So bear with us. <laughs> We're all getting settled in, Got some lunch, and all the things you need. Okay, I think we're and we'll get rolling. All right, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today for part three of Fresh Energy's Intersection of Energy and Community webinar series. Uh, so we've been doing these webinars through the month of July and this is part three. I am Janice Swartz. I am uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior associate here at Fresh Energy on our energy access and equity team. Fresh Energy is a Minnesota-based nonprofit working towards a vision of a just, prosperous, and resilient future, powered by a shared commitment to a carbon neutral economy. So today we're going to have a conversation about authentic community engagement. So over the next hour, uh, I'm joined by two awesome people that I admire and respect so much. Uh, so we're going to have a discussion uh, about the difference between public input and a co-created climate vision. Uh, drawing, drawing from the three of us, our experience forming and being part of the City of St. Paul's new Climate Justice Advisory Board, which we affectionately call CJAB. <laughs> so this is a, something that we, we think is one of the first in the country and certainly is a model that many other cities are watching closely. So it's going to be fun to talk about today. Uh, focus of the board, which was formed in 2020. Is, align, is to align St. Paul's climate action work uh, from the Climate Action Resiliency Plan. Uh, and so to align this work with the needs and interests of uh, the communities that are facing climate change, like the brunt of climate change the most, mostly BIPOC, Black Indigenous and people of color communities and under-resourced communities. And that's, that's what we're here to talk about today. So thing, it's gonna be a great conversation. Before we get started, uh, do some housekeeping and thank our promotional partners uh, for the webinar series. So shout out to our sponsors and partners who help spread the word about this event. So thank you to the AIA, uh, CERTS, Climate Generation, Midwest uh, Building Decarbonation Coalition, uh, Minnesota Electrical Association, Mencia, Pollen, RMI, Sierra Club, The Nature Conservancy, and WSB. So thank you to you all for spreading the word. All right, and with that, we're gonna meet our awesome panel. So I am joined today by Audrey Arquin, member and youth leader of the St. Paul Climate Justice Board. Uh, so Audrey is a member with me and Russ Stark, Chief Resiliency Officer for the city of St. Paul. Uh, and I will be wearing just a note, I'll be wearing two hats today. So one is moderator and of course uh, uh, staff at Fresh Energy and there are other as co-chair of the Climate Justice Advisory Board. Uh, and so Audrey, Russ and I, and the members of the Climate Justice Advisory Board have been working together over the past year. Uh, and this is gonna be uh, one of our first times getting to share and reflect with uh, an audience about our experiences. So hello, Audrey and Russ, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Doing well, thanks for having us. Yeah, really excited to be here. Awesome, thank you both so much. So yeah, so we, we hope that you all listening to the webinar uh, and the podcast soon will uh, leave here with a better understanding of what's possible in terms of local uh, community progress on climate and what it really means to have a co-created process and actionable steps towards local engagement in climate planning, which of course we all have, we all have to play a role in because it's happening right now. <laughs> so we're going to start out with a panel discussion and then we'll move to Q&A for the last 15 minutes. Um, many of you submitted questions in advance, but if you didn't, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. 
you know, not the chat, use the Q&A so we see it, uh, and to send in your question. Uh, all right, so let's let's dive right in. Uh, we start with you, Russ, to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work at the City of St. Paul. And I'm all right, thanks, Denise. Well, again, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm Russ Stark. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of St. Paul, working in Mayor Carter's office. I've been in this role for about three and a half years now, and uh, the mayor really has me in this role focused on climate and sustainability across the city's work. Uh, there are CROs out there who have other areas of focus as well, but mine is really quite focused on climate and sustainability. And one of those um, duties is now to help staff the Climate Justice Advisory Board. So pleasure to be here and look forward to launching deeper into this conversation. Wonderful, thank you. And Audrey, how about you? Hi everyone, my name is Audrey Arquin. I use he, him pronouns. I'm currently about to become a senior at Central High School in St. Paul. Any St. Paulites out there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I sort of <laughs> do a lot surrounding sort of environmental justice, both in the worlds of policy and activism. Um, I got my start through an organization called the Minnesota Youth Council that does a lot of work um, uplifting youth voice. And I specifically focus on working on environmental justice policy and sort of seeing how we can get sort of young people more knowledgeable uh, about environmental justice, how we can write good policy impacting young people about environmental justice. And then also with uh, a big youth org called Minnesota Youth for Climate Justice, sort of digging in, looking at how we can impact communities across the city, how we can help young people that are dealing with problems surrounding environmental racism and all the different mm -hmm. things that come with the climate crisis and those disproportionate impacts. So it's really awesome to be here. Amazing. Thank you both so much. It is really such an honor to work with both of you. And yeah, I get to, I'm, I'm so lucky to get to learn from the both of you and, and to do this work. So uh, yes, yeah, so we are part of the Climate Justice Advisory Board, CJAB. Uh, there's about 15 of us on the board. Um, so the CJAB is a kind of one of a kind board as we're discovering that is focused on climate justice for the city. Um, and something I wanted to share is that we've been working on a definition of climate justice at the Climate Justice Advisory Board. Um, still, it's still a working de definition as both of you know, <laughs> but I wanted to share some pieces that uh, I think that we, we've been working to really uh, center. And that's, that we, I think we all agree that St. Paul, what, what can St. Paul look like uh, if it had a just and equitable uh, focus for climate? And so uh, I think that feel, looks and feels like where the, where there's equitable systems that allow for our diverse residents and neighborhoods to participate in decision-making uh, and where we can all thrive in. And so in which the systems of like systemic racism and sexism environmental racism, economic inequality, these, thi these things that have exacerbated climate change, uh, they have, they've really been addressed and certainly that the system has been rebuilt and reimagined. Uh, so I just wanted to like put that out there as like, that's just kind of a, a, a way that we're trying to kind of organize ourselves and guide ourselves through this work. Um, so um, yeah, so let's start with kind of just like talking about what the board how it's like functioned and structured. Uh, so Russ, maybe you can kind of fill us in on what the board does and is from your perspective, uh, being staffer to our board. Absolutely. So the Climate Justice Advisory Board was created by a resolution of the city council and its purpose is really to advise the mayor, the council and city staff about the best ways for our city programs and policies to reflect this idea of climate justice and to ensure that our programs in climate and energy and to some degree in transportation are benefiting our frontline uh, and most vulnerable uh, populations and communities at least as much as everyone else, if not more so. And so uh, it is a brand new thing and it's been fun to sort of uh, really uh, co-create that structure with the board after you all uh, have come on. Uh, but it's really also meant to establish more of a two-way conversation yeah. between the city and the community at large around these issues, um, as opposed to sort of the occasional 
uh, outreach around a particular uh, topic. It's really meant to be that ongoing place where we are engaging around these critical issues. Yes, yeah, and that's, that's what's interesting is the the way that it's like, as we're trying, we're going to talk about how the board became kind of an output of community engagement and will hopefully serve and function as a as a, a model for community engagement as well. Um, so yeah, so uh, to talk about kind of where the idea of the board came from, um, I can attest to uh, being a part of that. Uh, Russ and I, we, we spent, uh, we had meetings together, um, not just the two of us, but as part of the community engagement uh, process for um, kind of introducing the climate action plan, the climate action and resiliency plan for the city. Uh, we had put together some meetings with environmental justice advocates, and it was within those meetings that this idea of the board came from. Uh, and I'm just like, was so amazed to you know be able to see the progress of that being an idea that came from community members of St. Paul, and now here we are in its like actualized form, which is very very cool. Um, so yeah, if there's a if there's things that you want to share about the, that experience too, Russ, just uh, as because I'm sure all that groundwork from getting it from the idea, <laughs> and for all of us advocates saying like yeah, the city sh should do this like. <laughs> Go do it. <laughs> you had to actually be there behind the scenes, putting it together uh, to make it to make it real to the resolution form. <laughs> Absolutely, it was. Um, yeah, so we spent about uh, nine months in total engaging the community in what started out as a, a first draft of the climate action resilience plan, and then went through multiple iterations of the plan after that feedback started coming in. And one of the consistent themes that we heard. Uh, especially at that environmental justice advocates table that you helped organize, Denise, but really even more broadly at some of the community engagement sessions that we had was we, as community members, what we heard a lot of, we really care about this topic. We want to know how to stay engaged and involved in the city's work, um, not just when you're developing a plan every so often, but actually around kind of the, the month to month and year to year work of advancing uh, climate action in a just and equitable way in St. Paul. And so how, how can we do that? And so the suggestion of the board, I thought was a really great first step. And I emphasize that this is really just the first step in kind of building out an infrastructure of engagement around climate justice mm -hmm. in the city. Um, so that we have a group of the 16 of you who are now our sort of first line of communication out to the community about uh, our, our ideas that are sort of emanating from the city about how to address uh, the climate crisis uh, with programs and policy. But it will equally, I hope, work in the other direction as well. You all bringing ideas to the table, uh, helping us prioritize those actions, helping to really shape policy and program uh, in a way that's going to be beneficial uh, for, our, for our communities and, and for the city overall. And I think, you know, climate work is so tricky because mm -hmm. Uh, like a lot of work because uh, the it's so urgent that we take mm -hmm. action and take action quickly. Um, but if we if we just rush and try to do things without really talking to people about how uh, how some of those things uh, might involve, include them, affect them, uh, we're going to get it wrong. Um, and we're going to get it wrong sometimes anyway. Uh, but I think we can feel a lot more confident. Um, with the CJAB in place and with some uh, broader community engagement that we can do on top of that, that when we do come to the, uh, adopting a new policy or really setting on a new path, that we've really thought through uh, some of the implications and, and costs and benefits in a way that's going to benefit our whole community. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So yeah, so Audrey, in, in hearing the things that Russ is bringing out there, um, you joined the board as one of our three youth members, um, something that I, I, I can speak for myself, I know that was super important that we were including young people's voices, uh, especially because and 
this is climate climate justice work, environmental justice work, um, clearly is going to affect all of us. But of course, it's going to affect young people even more because we this is this is your future. This is all all of our present as well, <laughs> but it's also your future. So we needed to make sure we have these voices on the board. But you are a busy person. You're like everywhere <laughs> doing all sorts of things. Uh, what what made you want to join the board? And uh, you know, how is it going for you? Yeah, I will not lie. There's there's <laughs> never there's never enough time in the day. Um, but as I said earlier, thinking about sort of the areas in which I was doing work before I joined CJAB, um, policy work at a state level, and then also diving deep into communities, into these small groups, whether it be a school community like we've done at Central many times, or whether it's small neighborhood communities. Um, really the intersection of that is CJAB. It's this mm. idea of how do we create policy in a wide manner surrounding an issue like the climate crisis, like environmental justice, and how do we do that for communities inside St. Paul? Mm -hmm. So once I sort of got that in my head, once I sort of figured out this really, this really obvious now in my head intersection, it was almost a no brainer um, on those things. And sort of this idea of like, how do we combine the role of activism and how do we combine the role of community mm -hmm. discussion and communities and sort of this idea of like the unofficial things that we do in order to help others, this sort of all these different things and how do we combine that with the, the institutional policy making has always mm -hmm. been really interesting to me. And I think, mm -hmm. while no one has perfected sort of coming up with that connection, I do think that there's opportunities inside the Climate Justice Advisory Board to sort of accomplish those goals. And the other thing is that um, knowing that those there was youth member spots was really important to me mm -hmm. because I think number one, as you said, Janice, the climate crisis and climate justice is a uniquely, an issue that is uniquely impacting young people. And we think about the effects of climate change. Now we know they're gonna get worse in the future and we know it's gonna be our generation that sort of is the ones that are bearing the brunt of those impacts. And we also know inside St. Paul, there's all these problems with widening disparities between students of color and white students, mm -hmm. disparities mm -hmm. between low income students, things that have not been helped by the last year and the impacts of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Yes. And all those things are so important when we talk about environmental justice as a young person, as a person that goes to school with so many different people in a community like St. Paul Public Schools, all those things, I think, made it so important for me to be a part of CJAB. Thank you. I really, really love that you're drawing out that this is like this connection of activism and policy and like kind of how do we bring activism into these like more institutionalized spaces because that's what it's going to take. So it's going to take and I, I, I fully resonate with that and connect with that and um, and even just knowing that there's challenges in the education system, uh, especially when it comes to teaching about climate change and climate crisis, right? Like if we're, we are past, past that point, that this is a crisis, this is an emergency. Um, and so how are we going to engage and um, actually we'll listen and, and learn from young people uh, and, and understand that this is, you said, uniquely impacting youth. Um, so, so is this what you, so far, I mean, I should mention, we've, we've only been meeting since February. <laughs> Uh, we were formed in uh, 2020, like again, the resolution, uh, but you know, it took time for all of us to submit applications and to uh, have the conversations about what this is going to look like. So we've only been kind of functioning since February. Um, but so far, is this what you anticipated? Is there, are there things that um, surprised you or um, that you're looking forward to? I can pose that to both of you, but Audrey first, if there's anything there. Yeah, I think. It's always it's always difficult going into new places and especially going into sort of these places that are being formed as you're a part of it. And there's mm -hmm. both exciting things about that and there's both things that come at you and you're like, where did that come from? I did not expect to be working on things like this. Um, but I do think sort of in my perspective through these first five or six months, really for me, the one thing that has been really obvious has been that the group of people we have do have the capability of sort of like discovering these new things of working towards the issues, going back to what I said about common, co the combination of activism and policy. Mm -hmm. I do feel like the, the people we have have sort of the ability to do that. And that's been really impressive. And that's been something mm -hmm. 
I really wished we had. And I think that's something that we're going in the direction of. Um, the other thing that I think has been really important, which is something that I anticipated, but every time it's always very interesting is this idea of institutionalized youth voice. Mm. And when it comes to that, it's so much of a mixed bag in so many spaces to figure out groups that include young people, what is the role of young people actually? And it's not just in climate spaces, it's not just in policy making spaces, it's in so many spaces where um, we're at the point where people are now starting to include young people more, which is really important, but we now see that there's all these different things that uh, like how, how we are included is a really important thing. And I think that's one thing that I've noticed. I think we've done a really good job of sort of using young people in a way that um, benefits them and also benefits other young people in their communities, which is the most important part of including young people in these positions. Um, and that's something that I wanna to continue to think about is like mm -hmm. how do we institutionalize youth voice here and across different organizations in better ways. But those are the two things that have really stood out to me for the first five or six months. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that leadership development piece is I think like of utmost importance. Um, it's what, what good is it to say, oh, we're, we've got youth members on this board or this ad hoc committee, what have you. And then to like not actually give you space to grow and to learn and to contribute meaningfully, both for your own leadership development, but you know, kind of for the good of society. I think we all need to be paying a lot more attention to uh, what young people have to say. And I know, I know, I look young, but I, I've, I've been I've been in your position of being like I feel that that feeling of tokenization as a young person is uh, not a great feeling, <laughs> and we everyone needs to stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's give you the, all the space and the platform to to share your ideas. Thank you. Um, Russ, is there anything you'd like to re uh, respond in terms of things you've anticipated or anything that surprised you or oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that, having no a mute issue. Uh, I just wanted to comment briefly about the youth voice issue as well. Um, this is the first, so the City of St. Paul does have a, a youth commission that's on all youth board, uh, oh. but this is the first other advisory board where we intentionally included youth seats. And there's now a movement afoot among uh, the mayor's administration to start mm -hmm. adding youth seats to all of our boards. Um, I think the credit the youth for being so engaged in climate in particular, uh, that it almost seemed obvious and clear that we needed to have youth seats on this board from the beginning. And so we do have at least two seats uh, laid out in the city council resolution uh, for youth. We ended up with three uh, because we had three just fantastic applicants. And um, uh, in, the, in the process of developing the structure of the CJAB before you all came on, there was a real balancing act of like, wanting to have some structure, but also wanting you all to be able to come in and sort of make your own mark on how mm -hmm. the on how the board functions. And so I see some questions coming in about sort of policies and programs that we've maybe already worked on. And really, we're just in the infancy of getting to that place because we've spent some time uh, finalizing uh, our internal structure and process. We also have, a, I would say, a diverse group uh, in a lot of ways, uh, age-wise, uh, racial and ethnic uh, makeup, uh, gender, um, and also the degree of sort of expertise and background uh, in, in climate and, and policy work. And so I think there's also an element of all of us needing to sort of share information, hear about existing programs, and then also hear about uh, some of the new program proposals that are on the drawing board uh, to get a common language and a common understanding to be able to kind of help inform um, what's what's best moving forward. So I, I personally, the board yeah. has yeah. met and exceeded my expectations. And it's, huh. um, as, as I've shared with all of you, it is actually a sort of a new body of work for me. And it's, you know, time mm -hmm. not spent on other things, but it's for it's been uh, the, frankly, some of the best time that I've spent in the last six months in terms of uh, just thinking differently about the work and, and moving the work forward. So Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a good uh, segue that uh, goes to our next question. We're going to talk a little bit about the structure uh, of how we have 
organized ourselves. Uh, so, you know, as we're saying, this is a brand new committee. Uh, so we were kind of tasked with creating um, the structure for ourselves and really building it from the ground up, um, which of course presented its own challenges. But I think, um, I think most folks on the board would agree that we really wanted this to be something that was reflective of um, how we how we think about climate justice, particularly, uh, and, and community engagement in the ways that we um, setting ourselves up for a good way to do that. Um, so we just have, we just designed our leadership structure to have co-chairs. So like I said, I'm co-chair of the board. Um, Melissa Wenzel, shout out Melissa, is our other co-chair. Uh, we have a secretary, his name is Nick Martin. So shout out to Nick as well. And then Audrey, of course, you are our, our youth leader, uh, which, or youth chair, I can say that you chair the youth leader uh, position for, that makes up our kind of executive committee team. Um, but we really wanted to make sure that um, all of our, all of the board members, I mean, we're, we're all busy people. <laughs> you know, I think most people who like join boards and things um, do it because they care about their community, care about their city. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we are being conscientious of people's time and capacity. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the process um, of how we kind of came to this idea of our leadership structure. Um, maybe to start with you, Russ, how did, how did that feel and that process look to you as, of course, again, the staffer to this board um, and knowing that there are other commissions and boards at the city level, um, but here we are trying to do things just a tad bit differently. Yeah, well, I think um, it's a different sort of a board than we've had before at the city in um, in in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, and so, in terms of staffing, there's myself. There's another. Uh, there's Carlos from the mayor's office who's helping out with some of the logistics and really yes. kind of helping people kind of make sure they have what they need to participate uh, effectively. Um, and we may be the only board uh, that the city has that is staffed within the mayor's office, honestly. And partly mm -hmm. that's because um, uh, we needed to figure out where where the board could be kind of most effective and, and have the most direct tie into where the work was happening. And in our, in our administration, a lot of the city's work in the space is happening sort of through my leadership. And so it made sense to staff it there. Um, you know, moving forward, that might make, uh, there might be reasons to, to change that structure. It's interesting within city governments uh, in different places, the, the work of climate sustainability uh, happens in very different ways. Often there's an office of, of sustainability or mm -hmm. uh, resilience. And we have a more distributed model, I guess, in St. Paul in the way that we do the work. So we've got my position in the mayor's office, but then for the most part, I work with staff who are spread out across city departments doing different functions related to energy and transportation. and. Um, uh, green infrastructure and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, I think figuring out how to plug the board into all those different pieces is something that we're still, that is still evolving. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Uh, Audrey, I think it's going to respond to you um, as, we, as we try to make sure that the board, uh, that we're striking a balance between establishing roles and responsibilities uh, for it to not feel too hierarchical. That's something that I definitely was like, I don't want this to feel like <laughs> too um, prescribed and or too top down. Um, how is, has this been like a different process from other boards and organizations that you're a part of? Um, and of course, in serving in this leadership role as the youth leader, are we are we being fair <laughs> to you as one of three of our youth leaders um, asking you to step into this leadership role? How has that felt for you? Yeah, I think one thing that I've noticed differently as a young person is my perspective on chaos and sort of mm. <laughs> organizations building themselves on the go is very different than with a lot of older people. It's it's my forte, I'd say. I'm used to I'm used to seeing the spaces where you come in and you're having to build yourself up before you can actually do real work, which is sometimes it's hard and sometimes you get sort of that ability to build everything up and you get to design it the way you want it to be, and that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things we talked about being really intentional about um, is that idea of not having a hierarchical committee, sort of allowing people to have the ability to sort of discuss this idea of climate justice in a space that feels like equal, it feels representative. I know Russ, you were talking earlier about having a really diverse group of ages of 
racial makeup, of also ability and experience. Um, and I think that's really important in this conversation about climate justice. And that's one of the things that I think is really smart about not having a hierarchical model is because when, when it comes to an issue like climate justice, oftentimes the people that are being affected most are those with the least capacity, the least served communities. And oftentimes right. um, when we don't have those perspectives because we focus so much on having only people that have worked in such and such sector for 10 years, we miss the we miss the really important perspectives that can make and break sort of this topic of climate justice. And I think that gets into the bigger conversation about um, community engagement is how do you truly represent a community while also having the ability to do a lot of really good work. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about that I know we've been intentional about and I think it's a really interesting question to think about moving forward. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a, and of course, this has been a year, <laughs> right? Like the, the, even stemming from last year, we've all been through a lot. And having, I think, another, just to kind of talk about this like role of this space um, and why um, it can be what being a model of community engagement can also look like is this being a space where we can bring things that we're all experiencing, collectively experiencing, or even individually experiencing um, out and, and be able to make those connections to climate justice. So I wanted to tell a quick story about um, a, a very particular letter that we that we wrote to the mayor's office and to city council. So um, stemming back to uh, when Dante Wright was killed in Brooklyn Center by Brooklyn Center police, uh, for all of us who live in St. Paul may remember <laughs> that, uh, there was a curfew that was imposed in St. Paul um, in response to a lot of the uprisings that, and reactions that was happening in Brooklyn Center to, to Dante Wright's killing. And um, I felt from, I felt from the get-go um, something we, in our very first meeting, we went around kind of saying like what our kind of hopes and aspirations of this board will be. And I remember saying the thing I, I wanted was for this to be a powerful space because we're all powerful people. And this is, the the fight of our times right now is around climate the climate crisis and how all these intersecting um, crises are are happening right before our eyes right between the COVID nineteen pandemic and so much around racial reckoning that is long overdue so back to this letter so after the there was the imposing of the curfew um, I emailed you all and said is this something that we as the climate justice advisory board can um, say, can we say something? Can we do something? I just have, I, you know, I think I came to you all with a lot of feelings of uh, how I was experiencing, um, seeing what was happening in Brooklyn Center, feeling a sense of needed solidarity, uh, but that, but the curfew, <laughs> that curfew really, that said, everybody's, you know, get home by 10 p.m. or, you know, whatever it was, like stay off the roads. Uh, obviously, like National Guard was called in. Um, it was very reminiscent of the George Floyd uprisings in 2020. And it just made me feel like this. I don't know personally if that really felt like the right response. But I came to you all as Climate Justice Advisory Board, to our full board, um, and asked for us to express, uh, express our uh, feelings in a letter to Mayor Carter and the City Council. And so I just wanted to, because um, there are some questions, I know that that's uh, not a, a policy, right? But like the the and very important connection between what's happening with police brutality, system of racism, uh, climate, uh, the fact that we had National Guard uh, up and down our streets, even in Brooklyn Center, there was a lot of munitions that were being used that was impacting the air quality. I mean, the noise of tanks up and down our streets. <laughs> uh, all of that felt to me like a clear disruption of our environment. And I just really wanted to be clear that this is also part of climate chaos and like what happens when uh, people are reacting in a sort of way and then we get like our institutions uh, reacting back to us. Um, I just really wanted us to think about what that intersection of climate justice and race, um, police brutality was and to make a statement. Uh, so that kind of that kind of came with came with a lot of questions around is this like is this our role <laughs> is this something that we can do that's something that I asked like is this something I was like hey Russ is this something we can do is this something that's appropriate um, and you know I think for 
that came came down to be from the most the members felt that it was something that was appropriate but i think that was a, a real test of like being able to look at the scope and the role of the board um yeah so thank you for the time for to share that to share about that um for the two of you uh was there what kind of like reflections or responses did you have um from the letter and just kind of thinking about our overall like role as a board and for, certainly in communicating also with the mayor's office and city council uh maybe rest to you first if you want to start yeah it really made me appreciate how um your um you're starting that conversation about an about an issue that as we've discussed at the board is very related uh to climate work um was the beginning of oh you know this board is going to want to communicate about things uh that the city might not have necessarily specifically asked them to communicate <laughs> about you know but that but that role of advising the mayor and council is at the heart of it and so you all sort of took the authority given to you as a board to communicate something to the mayor and council which is exactly what uh, they've asked you to do and i can uh, i can share as a follow-up to janice's story that the board actually requested that the mayor join them at their next meeting and the mayor came and spent an hour with okay. the board talking about this as a yes, as an important follow-up conversation which um again some of the things we're doing are unprecedented and i don't I don't know that that's happened in other cities, um, but it, it feels good to be in one where that can happen um, and where the board's uh, letter and position was taken very seriously uh, with a with a direct kind of response and engagement. Thank you. Andre, you, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think for me one of the things that was really important about that is during that time we were having our discussion about what we wanted our definition for climate justice to be and um i think through that conversation i felt we didn't really get like a total answer in that idea and then when janice came with this letter it sort of hit this thing that i always sort of envision is this idea of like what is environmental justice um and I, most of this is taken from Angela Davis, who mm. gave this incredible definition that I forever will use, which is that mm. um, environmental justice is literally anything that impacts the environment in the unjust manner. And our environment is everywhere we live, everywhere we work, everywhere we act. And that is, ha that is policing, yes. that is housing, that is education. It's all related. It's all intersectional in so many ways. Um, Love that. The yes. example that I always use, and I think it connects, um, is with the Herc incinerator. That's an environmental issue because we're burning trash, which is creating pollution, but then it's a health issue. And mm -hmm. that health issue is then an economic issue, and that economic issue then becomes a policing issue, which is also then a housing issue. And I think when, I, when we read that letter, when I saw that, I think that entwined in, in with sort of defining our role as a council. I think those two things together made me realize, number one, that there are people that are thinking the same way I am about what we can do as a council, what we can do as a group of people. But also once we were able to send that letter, I think it gave me the chance to say, well, here's a new idea. Here's what we can actually do in mm. sort of impacting all these spaces, impacting all these different communities in a way that's much broader than maybe it was envisioned, but in the end is all still interconnected. It's all still this idea of climate justice, this idea of environmental justice. Mm. Oh, thank you, Audrey, for invoking Angela Davis. That is, let me see, she's, if anybody doesn't know, please look her up, <laughs> please. Um, but what a really important way to define environmental justice that is an in, injustice, right? Like anything that impacts the environment in an unjust manner. Um, and that's, yeah, what we, there are myriad of examples of that everywhere we are, because like you said, it's everywhere that we are, like our, work, home, play, school, like every everything is the environment and, and everything we touch is going to have an impact. So how do we have the most amount of positive impact or at least, at least the least amount of negative impact on our environment? But we have to be very conscious about how different people are experiencing that in, in, in different ways. Thank you. So thanks for letting me tell that story you all. Um, so moving on to, it's actually, I think, dovetails pretty 
well into this kind of section of barriers and opportunities. Uh, that to me was like a clear, I felt like this was, that was a clear opportunity to kind of cement or at least state uh, where um, this, of how, how can this board be powerful? How can we use our influence? How can we um, use uh, some means of communication to express um, things that are, that we're all uh, experiencing or witnessing happening in our community? Uh, so as barriers and opportunities um, arise with this board, uh, let's first talk just a little bit about capacity, uh, because new boards, again, equal new work, uh, because we are all very, very busy people. So uh, and Rusty spoke to this just a little bit, but uh, kind of this being a part of your, your overall work now and, and the role as staffer. Um, yeah, how, is, how has, been, has been for you <laughs> taking, on, taking on this role? Well, it's it's been a real pleasure, and um, I think a big part of my role overall at the city is thinking about. I actually do work directly on programs and the development of policies, but a, a piece of it is also thinking about how and in what uh, in what ways can we build the city's capacity to better tackle uh, the climate crisis. Um, and I would say before the board's creation, I thought about that mostly in terms of like adding city staff, like adding people who are actually paid to do more, uh, more work uh, uh, tackling the climate crisis. And we very much still need to do that. Um, but, uh, but the creation of the board is, a, I would say, another and probably at least as important way in which we've added capacity. Um, because we're only going to be able to do hard things if uh, people in our community uh, want us to do them, are bought into the ways in which we are proposing to do them, um, and ultimately can kind of co-create them. I've I've told I've talked a little bit to the board about this example of a, a new project that we're getting ready to launch. Uh, where we did do some uh, fairly deep community engagement in ways that we're pretty proud of. But, and, and this is around um, a new network of uh, EV uh, charging stations and a, a new EV car share system that's going to be operated here by our local nonprofit, Our Car. Um, so anyway, proud of the way in which we engage the community there. But the idea came from us. It came from a combination of city staff working with our car and, and other folks. And then we sort of went out and tested the idea and got some input on it. But really uh, what excites me about the board is, is the potential for uh, community members to really be in at the, at the birth of uh, program and policy ideas and to, and to help co-create them as really being kind of that that best model that will actually, in the end, allow us to move faster together. I talked earlier about that issue of urgency and sort of mm. wanting to move fast. Mm. Um, but uh, there's an old saying about uh, uh, if if you wanna if you wanna move fast, go alone. Um, and if uh, and if and if you wanna uh, move slow, go uh, move not slow. <laughs> if you wanna go far, go together. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's um, right. I uh, got it wrong there for a second, but, um, and I think there's a ton of, there's a ton of truth in that. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about not just the city's capacity, but the city's capacity to partner more effectively with our community, um, has been a new part of my thinking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Audrey, is this, uh, going forward? Um, I think go back speaking to, uh, going far, how do we make sure we, uh, kind of move at a healthy pace, like a healthy and effective pace, uh, just so we can all keep, keep our time and our sanity balance. Cause there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. And that's always the difficult balance of knowing that we are, we are so many people that are doing so many different things yet. We all believe that the work we're doing is important. How do we, how do we reconcile those two things? Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is we have made it very open. We have one meeting per month. Um, and, and what we do is like outside of that, there are many opportunities to interact with people. We have, we always are like emailing each other. We're always in communication with each other. Um, and I think that's, what's been really helpful. It's been sort of this idea that there's always people that are going to have the capacity at a given moment to sort of push forward and to keep moving. And maybe all, I'm not sure on the number, I don't wanna get it wrong. Maybe not all of us 
all, not all of us have capacity during an entire month. We only have capacity during this one meeting slot. But because we are all so invested in this project, because we're all so sort of centered and focused on this idea of ensuring a better future for St. Paul, this idea of ensuring we have better climate justice initiatives in St. Paul, throughout the entire month, we still have people that are in and out, people that have capacity. And I think that's been really important. And I think that's really allowed us to sort of, in a sense, keep going throughout these long stretches where we don't see each other and keep developing, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. as we're building, as we're going. Having month breaks is really hard and being able to sort of see that progress between meetings, see sort of that, that construction of the structure, the ideas, I think that's all that worked in a really, in a really nice manner. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know we're, we should move on to questions here in a moment. Um, I just wanted to uh, see if I can drop in the chat, just a little link to the board. Uh, let's list our kind of board details. It's listed on the city's website. Um, our, we do meet once a month. Uh, it's like the second Thursday of the month or so uh, from, I should probably get the camera. I'm like looking at you like, when do we meet? <laughs> Maybe it's six o'clock, six to eight. Yep, like six, six yeah. to seven thirty, yep. <laughs> 730. And they are open to the public. Um, so if you if you do want to attend a meeting, um, let me just drop this in the chat here. Uh, at least try to get you can try to get into contact with us so we can make sure that you can join. Because um, I know there's a question about like um, a web page that will give like updates and things about our and minutes and agendas. Uh, I believe that we have that set up or we're coming soon. But here, let me drop this in the chat really quick. Uh, and then, so before we move on to our Q&A very quick, just wanted to do kind of a quick wrap up of like, what is success, what will success look like for our board? Um, what are things that you all are hoping uh, that we can, as we move forward, you know, what would success look like after, after a year and after our terms? Um, where are we hoping that, we'll, where will we be? What does the success look like for the CJAB? Oh, thank you, Russ, for dropping this. Sure. Oh, uh, Russ, do you want to start? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think success is going to look like um, having uh, built uh, stronger relationships among board members and a common understanding of kind of current conditions, current programs, current policies, and therefore an understanding of where some of the gaps are. Um, and also, uh, somewhat of a game plan about how the how the board can be a part of this idea about broader community engagement, um, how we can sort of use you all as that, uh, as I mentioned, kind of first line of engagement, but also um, coming up with ideas about how to more deeply engage with community members, whether through community based organizations or public forum or, or whatever the case may be uh, around different topics. Um, all those things take time. And it's that sort of it's that whole thing about sort of moving slow and moving fast. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think success uh, uh, will look like the board feeling truly engaged in the work uh, for me, um, and uh, and adding value to to the city's work, which I would say you've you've already done. So I feel like we're already most of the way there. Audrey. Yeah, anyone who knows me really well is uh, knows that I'm very big on what are what are the tangible tactile impacts of what we're doing? What, what are the results? And so for me, success is really going through and saying, here's exactly where we transformed, here's exactly where we changed, here's exactly where we impacted city policy, whether it be in a really small way, whether it be in a really big way, here's, here's where we really accomplished our goal of ensuring that the city is focusing on climate justice and here, here's the results, here are the impacts. Um, I think answering that question, especially when it comes to the climate crisis is hard because mm. we all wanna say our end goal with success is there is no more climate crisis. But I think looking deeper and saying that we're in this role, we're in this position, we've been given these, these privileges by the mayor and by the city we have the people and we've talked about sort of getting the right group together that represents the city that knows how to sort of create change in many different ways. Um, and sort of knowing that we have the power, we have the position, we have the people that are able to sort of impact city policy. 
and going from there and saying, well, then success is impacting city policy and let's see what we can do in the next five years. In the end, what are our results? And for me, that's what true success will be. Mm. Yes, I love that. We have the people, we have the power to, to make change and to impact policies and, and to impact all of our lives in ways that are that we all need. Because I, yeah, I mean, the climate crisis, it's here. It's kind of here to stay. I think we have to figure out how we're gonna live with it and to, um, I mean, that mitigation and adaptation is really important, but it's like, what does, what does our future hold and, and how are we making sure that we're imagining a future that's livable? Um, something a little more like visionary, I guess, but I think that that's what I would name as success. All right, so uh, before we move on to Q&A, I think uh, my colleague's gonna throw up on the screen here. Thank you, Russ and Audrey, for talking through uh, so much of our reflections about this first half, uh, six months of being on this board. I really appreciate you both. Uh, quick housekeepings. Uh, we will have part four of this uh, webinar series that Fresh Energy has been hosting, the intersections of energy commun and community, um, next Thursday at noon. So my colleague, the amazing Margaret Cherney Hendrick, will be mo moderating a discussion uh, with uh, Margaret Garcia, Associate Director of Elevate, and Keith Kinch, Co-Founder and General Manager of Black Power. And they will be discussing electricity instead of gas. So that's a, a way to talk about uh, this transition of moving away from natural gas. And then uh, we're on the subject of events. Uh, Fresh Energy's next big event, our biggest one we do every year is our benefit breakfast. Of course, it'll be virtual again this year due to the pandemic, but that's okay. It's still a great time. So our benefit breakfast is October 14th. Registration is open right now. And we will be featuring the award-winning climate tech entrepreneur, Danelle Baird, CEO of Brooklyn-based Block Power, an organization proving that businesses can tackle carbon pollution while making a profit and creating family-supporting jobs. So you can register at freshenergy.org slash benefit breakfast and hope you all join us then and join us again next week. Okay, to the Q&A. There's lots of good questions in here in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is just kind of like administrative one. I know, like I mentioned, there's, uh, we meet monthly, but, um, and I've dropped, tried to drop the link in the chat about uh, where to find more details about the board. Uh, but uh, do we have a web? I don't know if we have like a city sponsored web page that shows our agendas <laughs> in minutes yet. We don't, uh, Carlos is actually working on that. So apologies to those uh, who are asking these questions and, and trying to find us and haven't um, found much success yet, but we are working on that. And in the meantime, I will um, post my email address, reach out to me, and we can make sure that you get access to meetings if you want to attend. Um, and those minutes and agendas will be posted soon. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Uh, one of the questions we got uh, that was submitted to us prior to the event um, was, is from Anjali. So how do we build knowledge and capacity in a community to co-create a vision and or engage in policy that is either wonky or may not be that pressing of a priority? So it's kind of like, how do we build up this collective knowledge and capacity for our entire community that, you know, th there's a lot of people who don't even, don't even know what kind of policies are being discussed or even what kind of problems even exist because they're just out there living their lives and, you know, trying to get through to day to day. That's a very, it's a very real thing. So how do we kind of build this collective capacity and knowledge um, around these issues in our communities? You know, if either one of you put an attack for that first. <laughs> I can jump in first. Um, <laughs> for me, that's really important because um, especially as a youth organizer, that's the number one thing we focus on is how do you get youth educated and aware on the issues that are impacting them? Um, and I think that's the most important. And I can speak to how sort of there's been models of saying, like, how do we do it in the classroom? And then maybe rest mm. more to talking about not young people. <laughs> but um, in those spaces, I think one of the things we really focus on is number one, policy. How do we ensure that our policies um, uplift the correct things, are uplifting the correct curriculum, are supporting the right students, are supporting the right teachers? That's really important. And then also understanding the idea of youth power and sort of ensuring that we have young people that are also teaching young people mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. that 
oftentimes the best way to educate young people is through their peers because we know each other the best. We know how to get through to each other. Um, and oftentimes adults don't really have the same capacity and understanding of how information spreads inside high school mm -hmm. spaces or inside youth spaces. Um, and in that vein, those are, those are two of the things that we do a lot of work on is like, when we reach out to youth, we really want youth to be doing outreach. And also we need to make sure we center the right things in our policy, especially when it comes to education, when it comes to curriculum, those are really important things. Yes, peer-to-peer -peer teaching, mentoring makes a lot of sense. Russ, if you would like to respond or? Yeah, well, I feel like, you know, the climate crisis is sort of everywhere in, in the world right now. If you're, you know, if you ever turn on the news or listen or, or you know, read the paper, et cetera. And I think, and so I think, whereas a few years ago, maybe we had more of a challenge of convincing people mm -hmm. of the existence of the crisis. Now, I think the large majority, uh, even of the country, but uh, certainly of St. Paul, are really convinced and know that it's a challenge. Um, in fact, people are rating it as you know one of their top concerns uh, these days in, in national polls. So I do think it is really more about the conversation about the what can we do and the how. And it's probably the most com the most common question I get from community members, like what what can I do? And part of the answer I I think is is frustrating because there is only so much we can do as individuals. Um, and a lot of what needs to be done is really at that sort of level of policy and systems. Mm -hmm. um, but as individuals, we can all get engaged in those policies and systems, which is what you all are doing um, as CJAB members, which I think is critical. Um, but I, I also think that within just sort of city governance, we, we tend to sort of just put our heads down and try to get the work done um, and not be really good at communicating um, and engaging. And I think it's often true that we don't prioritize the communicating and engaging in our budgets because they are great, but not essential for getting the work done. It's sort of been the traditional attitude. And I think mm -hmm. um, I think maybe those attitudes are starting to change and you've probably heard it in, in, in what I've talked about here. Um, we literally won't be able to get the work done without, um, without doing more uh, kind of communicating, uh, engaging and, and uh, and, and getting uh, sort of surfacing those, those best ideas about how to move forward. Absolutely. And a question in the Q&A from Chelsea is, you know, will the CJEP have input on the American Rescue Plan funds, um, how they may be allocated? Uh, and I mean, that's something that I am definitely curious and interested in of, you know, how we can, so the American Rescue Plan funds are federal funds um, and, you know, so how they might come down through, to St. Paul, uh, yeah, I, I would love to. We haven't yet, Chelsea, I'll say that, but like, I would think that's, that's absolutely something that uh, CJ like is well in within our kind of purview and uh, within our scope to look at, look at those funds, especially in the ways that they're going to be distributed for climate resilience and action. Audrey, would you like to look at those funds too? <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's definitely something that's interesting. It's, it, I, I wonder how sort of we can think about funding in a real sense, because that's a much more tangible thing than a lot of things that we've sort of been discussing lately and saying, if we, if we were to receive this thing, what, what would be our priority and how we think we can sort of influence people and influence our communities the most using that money. Um, it would be interesting. I also think it'd be another step forward in sort of establishing ourselves as saying, and especially within the city, if we're given money, if we're given sort of the ability to control an aspect of funding, that's really mm -hmm. important. And that's on your way to becoming a big power player when it comes to how decisions are made. 100. Yeah, the, the American Rescue Plan is sort of a, a once in a generation type of thing uh, for, for city government in terms of um, figuring out the best approach to spending a fairly sizable pot of federal dollars that are arriving combination of this year and next year and can be spent over a few year period of time as opposed to needing to all be spent right away, which was the case with the CARES Act uh, last year. Um, so it gives us a little bit more time to think about the most effective uh, uses for those funds. There are some limitations. Uh, for the most part, they can't be spent on infrastructure. 
uh, which of course is a lot of where mm -hmm. ultimately our our climate work is going to be. Um, but they can be spent to support uh, households that were impacted by COVID mm -hmm. um, economically or health wise. And so we're doing some uh, thinking and, I, and I've mentioned to the CJAB, but really hasn't been a deep engagement yet around this idea of, can we uh, use that, um, that hook within the ARP uh, to potentially invest in some of the homes of our lowest income residents with weatherization and some home repairs um, so that we can reduce the energy cost burden on some of the folks who can least af afford to pay at the same time that we are um, reducing emissions. And that's, that would be sort of a sweet spot, uh, I think, mm. for, our, for yeah. our work, if we can figure out a way to do that. And so I'll be bringing some thoughts and ideas to, to see Jeb about that uh, in the very near future. Yes, and I know we're really close to time, but uh, I wanted to kind of try to combine these these questions in the chat here and Q and A from Jean and Christina about working with other um, community organizations and other potential uh, similar boards and committees that may exist in other Minnesota cities and counties. So Jean says that they live in Dakota County, um, and would the St. Paul board collaborate with other community boards? And I would say yes, like would love to. Um, again, we're we are still so new that we. And this is kind of part of like, what does community engagement look like going forward? Um, I think definitely collaborating with other commissions and boards that exist and certainly organizations. I mean, again, this board kind of came, the idea of it came from a collaboration of environmental justice advocates who some represent organizations who some who don't, but really we're just people. We're all just like people who live in the city and, and said that this is something that we need and this would be a, a good way to have a collective arm for community engagement. So um, definitely the, the hope is there. I think the aspiration is there is to collaborate with other committees and organizations. Um, Russ and Audrey, I wanna give you the last word before we sign off here. If there's anything you'd like to respond to that. Well, it's just been great uh, working with the two of you, with the rest of the board members. Um, I think it's it really is probably uh, the most exciting um, piece of, of my work right now, uh, because honestly, it's, uh, I think CJAB is, is, is helping to make me personally uh, hopeful about our ability to do this work together. Um, and uh, as I said before, like, I think, I, I think it's a sign that we are moving in a positive direction. We have a lot more work to do as a city to, to do this work well and effectively and to get to that place where we really are sort of co-creating things with our community. But that, that concept is something that Mayor Carter has really infused throughout his administration in terms of an approach. It's been a lot of community process on a lot of different topics before new policy proposals are brought forward. And so um, it's, uh, CJAB is a really important part of that and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing what we can do. And to Audrey's point earlier, seeing what that, uh, seeing where we, where we have measured up uh, over the next few years. Yes, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I know we're running a little time now. So uh, on behalf of everyone here at Fresh Energy, thank you for attending part three of our intersection of energy and community webinar series. Thank you, Russ and Audrey, you're both amazing. And I'm so grateful to work with you on this and on many other things. Uh, so thank you for your commitments to the city of St. Paul and to, and to climate justice, truly. Thank you all for joining us. A recording of this webinar will be posted at the Fresh Energy, at Fresh Energy's website, Fresh Energy fresh-energy.org slash publications and on our podcast because we have a podcast I hope you all subscribe to it. it's called decarbonize the clean energy podcast and it's available on all the podcasting apps so you can learn more about fresh energy's work at our website and how you can subscribe to our newsletter check out our latest blogs and make a donation thank you we are a nonprofit. <laughs> so thank you my email is there please reach out uh, about this and, and all things energy related and thank you all and have a really wonderful Thursday. Take care. Thanks, Denise.